Welcome back. This is Nicole Naditz, your host for this series of interviews that highlight what the high leverage teaching practices look like in the classrooms of accomplished world language educators. I want to thank the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for conceiving of this project, which includes not only these interviews, but will later feature a series of short TED Ed lessons and two webinars to dig deeper into these high leverage teaching practices. The second high leverage teaching practice focuses on building a classroom discourse community, a learning environment in which both the teachers and the students actively participate in meaningful conversations in a learning environment that nurtures the exchange of ideas. Our guest today is a recognized expert in fostering authentic, meaningful communication opportunities for her learners. Tony Tyson has a master's in foreign language teaching and a master's in education of diverse learners. She was the 2013 ACTFL president and the 2009 ACTFL National Language Teacher of the Year. A national board certified teacher, Tony is the world languages and dual language coordinator in the Thompson Schools in Loveland, Colorado. She has presented many workshops, keynotes, and webinars for national, regional, and state conferences, and has authored articles on differentiated instruction, technology and curriculum and assessment design, and more. Tony has many honors, including the Actful Nelson Brooks Award for the Teaching of Culture and the Actful Florence Steiner Award for Leadership. Thank you, Tony, for joining us today. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> so first of all, can you briefly tell us what the term classroom discourse community means to you? So uh, I would like to start off a little bit uh, with a quote from the book that says, what students ultimately learn about the languages and communication is closely connected to the types of interactional practices that teachers provide in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. So if you really think about a community, when you think about discourse, that's communicating. Okay, and that's a basic part of our uh, world language readiness standards. That's standard one. So it says that. And when you're talking about a community, you're talking about building these relationships with the, the students who are in your class. You really want to foster trust and build those relationships so those communications can be real and meaningful. So when you take a look at that, we're going to um, building this over time you have to think about how are you gonna to connect to the kids? What are things that are meaningful for them? And as teachers, particularly as world language teachers, we're probably the ones that have the most connection with kids in any other content area because right from day one, you know, what's your name, where do you live? We, we ask all these personal questions and we get to know each other. And it's not just a teacher learning about the students, the students learn about the teacher and that fosters the trust and really builds a safe environment for communication because that's where the exchanges are going to occur. When you have, you know which way to go, uh, you can test out the kids how they're feeling during the day, that community builds over time. It's not a, all here it is, a one and done type of thing at all. And so you can constantly grow it as you get to know your students. So I think this is a really lovely part about it. But the other situation that's so important is, we need to be intentional. As teachers, we have to remember that there are certain patterns of discourse and whatever we, doing, we are doing, how does that elicit the type of responses our students give us? Whether they're with us, a teacher to student, or if they were student to a pair or student to a group. So we have to think about all that and how do we advance the learning of our students. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You brought up a couple of really good points, both that huge opportunity we have as language teachers to get to know our students in ways that a lot of other teachers don't get to do and to engage them in everyday conversations because that's just part of the work we need to do in our classes anyway. Um, so can you tell us a bit about the difference between the commonly observed pattern of teacher to student interaction that's referred to by the authors as initiate, respond, evaluate, versus the pattern the authors recommend that they abbreviate as IRF, initiate, respond, and feedback? Well, you know, for both of them, the first two letters are the same. It's the last letter. So think about the last letter. And the one, initiate, respond, and evaluate. 
probably this is the one that teachers for a long, long time have been taught to do. And that's when a student has a response, you're really just evaluating how it is. For example, one of the things they have in the book is, oh, hello, what time is it? It's 10 o'clock and the response is good, oh, good. It wasn't about finding out that it was 10 o'clock, who cares? You wanted to know if they knew that vocabulary piece. Or for example, if you were talking about a chain type of evaluation, you know, is John wearing a red shirt? Yes, he is wearing a red shirt. Are you wearing a red shirt? No, I'm not wearing a red shirt. What a dumb question to ask, because you can see right there if you have that on. So when you have this IRE, this evaluate, there's no real communication going on. It's basically doing a check. Can I check my vocab? Can I check the grammar? And maybe there's some times that that is good, but we don't want a lot of that at all because you never get to the point in any of that with real communication. Well, the next one, I, IRF, initiate responded feedback. Feedback is where we're going to try to push the conversation out and grow it. And so the, the teacher becomes less of a teacher and more of I'm listening and responding and listening and responding. So again, we could say that same thing, Hell, you know, what time is it? And the kid says 10 o'clock and you go, oh, 10 o'clock, it can't be 10 o'clock already. You know, I, I have to go somewhere. What, what are you doing tomorrow at 10 o'clock? So it just advances the conversation. And you know, another thing is, do you like pizza? Well, I like pizza. No, I don't like pizza. What else do you eat? And you're really eliciting that feedback to see what they can do, how they can grow it. And that's the model you want to use when they want to have interactions with a pair, a partner, or in group types of things. So just remember that F for feedback is like a force, a force to move the conversation on. Yeah, absolutely. And it really calls to mind to make sure that we honor and value the responses that our students bring into the room, as opposed to, you know, saying, as you said, saying, oh, very good, when that is very unnatural for the information they were providing. That doesn't make sense within that context. No, you would never do that on the street. No, no, <laughs> right? Because some patterns that you develop as teachers become natural and embedded. You're not going, this is the role I'm going to play, or else you really are not thinking about how you're going to get the kids engaged in the conversation and this discourse community. And we'll have a chance to dig in a little bit deeper how you can use that more natural response as a way to help them develop and further their language skills and even clarify misunderstandings. Yes, exactly. um, what are some strategies that you have used to ensure that the discourse in which learners engage during class reflects normal conversation patterns used by speakers of the target language outside of class? Well, I think there's two ways to look at that. One is like, first of all, what's the theme that you're working with? The theme or the novel or whatever. How are you gonna kind of elicit those types of questions that demand feedback that will get them into a natural response of things? The other thing is to find different ways that you can uh, really attach to their interest. Um, for example, uh, once a month, I would ask them to write on a sheet of paper, what do they want to talk about? And we put it in the talk about jar. And so we come at the beginning of the day and we go, oh, we've got to pull something out of the talk about jar. And we open it up and we go, oh, and we look at this and we start talking about that. I remember one time I asked the question about, so who's going to homecoming? And 20 minutes later, we've had a political discussion. We've had a clothing discussion. We, we had, a, you know, a gender discussion. And uh, by the time it was done, they were so heated up. I didn't want to stop it. It was, it was just so important to them. Um, I think when you're taking a look at some of these things, the way you can look at uh, some other types of ways to really get some natural response, games, competitions, okay? Um, you can send some tweets to someone and they can respond back to it. You can use all kinds of technology, polling and debating, anything that kind of picks their interest a little bit and gets them going. You know, they talk a little bit about chit chat. Uh, yes, we have goals in our classroom and are moving along, but chit chat, I think a lot at the beginning of the class warms them up and you're not there to correct them. You're not there. To, you're just there to find out things and, argue with them and help them out and be there and laugh with them and 
that community, again, building those relationships that foster trust is essential. So those are some of the things, you know, like scenarios, you set up scenarios. There are millions of different types of things. Gallery walks, if you think about that, you put pictures up along that maybe they've designed or drawn and you can take the gallery walk and they can work with a partner and have some time to interact with what they see. Um, photos too, photos and drawings are great. And one of the things particularly that happens in IB, IB, uh, one of their um, assessments was an internal assessment is to take a picture. We've been working with these pictures a lot. So you give the kids two pictures, they choose the one that they want to use, okay? And the idea of this is how they communicate. So first of all, there's little beats that two or three minutes where they have to describe it. But then there is a conversation between the teacher and the student about how this fits into one of their themes. Why is this important? Why did they choose this? And you can just build upon that and see what the knowledge that they have. And I think that's a, a really interesting type of assessment to do because you end up talking for about 12 minutes on this piece. The kids get very excited about it, but you can do that just by finding pictures and working a lot with that, whatever the theme might be. Any type of stimulus that gives them talking. Videos, pictures, drawings, actions, hats, clothing, <laughs> role play, you know. I think you really hit on the theme there a few times, you know, basically getting the students to talk in ways that look less like language practice and more like natural settings in which people engage in conversation anyway. And that leads right into our next question because the authors talk about something that they call conversational gambits and their role in fostering our learners' communicative proficiency. Can you share some examples of gambits that you've embedded into your learners' experiences and the impact you've seen as a result? Classroom gambits, what an interesting term, right? But think about those. What are the words and expressions that they need in order to be able to continue the conversation? For example, you might have some sentence starters, you might have some sentence frames, they might be on the wall, or you might have, one of the things I really like to use was placemats. The placemats are wonderful, where here you have in this corner, this is how you can start a conversation, Here's how you can end a conversation. Here's some of those words like, oh my, I don't know. I don't care. Uh, you know, can you continue? Help me out with this. I don't understand. And all of those, sometimes they're all that vocabulary that they want to say, and you want to obstruct what they're trying to think. So you help them out. And these gambits are, can be anywhere. Sometimes students want to make them. Sometimes they kind of develop them on their own. Sometimes there might be some kind of, a PowerPoint or video that's there with them, something where they have access to them. You know, and one of the things that I've seen before is very interesting, particularly in the idea of describing a picture, et cetera. That's, I also had an IB um, part of what I was doing. You, you almost make a frame around a picture. So you put the picture in the center and then you put the placement around it. So it helps them to talk about it's to the left, it's to the right in my opinion. And then you had the transition words like nevertheless, you know, um, all of those essential words. And some of those words are really fun in French, you know, nevertheless, ni à moi, just, <laughs> just the sound of that makes it fun for them. But it helps make the conversation smoother. And they can say those things and it, to them it sounds more natural. Again, that's part of the intentional planning, the intentional planning to make this work. Yeah, I think one of the things that sometimes teachers, myself included for a long time, you know, might forget to do is to really build in those support structures so that students start early in their language learning career using those gambits because over time they will become natural and embedded in how they communicate automatically. But that can't happen if we insist on waiting until year four or some magic time. So I also did placemats and even bigger table mats if they didn't want to have their placemat out to right. support that. And we, again, yeah, starting right from level one, I mean, it's right there. There's a whole series of them. And you just get better at putting them together. And then sometimes you ask the students to build them too. 
because they understand the concept of a placemat or words that they need. And yeah, absolutely. Um, can you share your thoughts on the role of interactional space in the classroom discourse community and then some of your go-to strategies for providing that for your learners? Well, one of the things about the interactional space is that the teacher, again, with the intentional planning, really has to think about um, their, they do not have to be the center of attention because really you want to move away from that teacher role into really facilitating communication. So even though sometimes it's very hard to do, you've got to sometimes provide a lot more wait time, let them think so they can get deeper and not that they have wait time and they can see you staring at them like, please hurry up and answer. <laughs> you have a tendency to jump right in, <laughs> but wait time that's authentic. And then how can you help them scaffold their answer? So you scaffold it by maybe asking a question or two that gets them a little bit deeper into it so they can feel a little bit more comfortable. Knowing that they understand what this is, I think it's just some ways to, to really make it feel like it's their space instead of the teacher's space. This is your time and place to talk. And here's how we're going to help you. And sometimes you can do it with interactional space by the way that you set up your room. What is the interactional space? Is it between a pair? How can you support them? How can you teach them to support each other? Sometimes is it with a group? Or if it's with teacher and student, how can you set up a certain part of your room that becomes like a section where that can happen too? Because that's one of the things when you have flexible seating and movement, um, the students feel like there's different places for different things. And I think they start to feel comfortable along those lines too. So I think that that's really important. Any way that we can support them along those lines, I really give it, it is, it's about giving them their space and letting that come out and helping them build that. Yeah, really good points. Um, the authors discuss five interrelated steps for building that classroom discourse community. And for our listeners, I'm gonna quickly restate what those five steps are. Um, the first one is ensuring familiarity with and among students, then designing contexts for interaction. The third step is infusing spontaneous interaction or chit chat with learners in and out of the classroom. The fourth is using humor. And the fifth is ensuring that learners benefit from interactional space that we were just talking about and that the discourse between teachers and students follows that initiate response feedback model that we discussed earlier. Which one or two of these do you personally consider the most important? And do you have any additional strategies that you recommend? Well, uh when I think about that, that was kind of a hard question because all of them are so important. And again, when you think about just a teacher in general, I think it's really what is their personality and what do they want to do exactly. But I really think that the first one, ensuring familiarity with and among students, is the main point. That's the part about building relationships. That is absolutely essential. So how do you build relationships? Well you're gonna care for each one of them. They all have to know that they have a value in class. And sometimes, you know, even though we understand that, we might favor a student or two, or happy when someone answers the question, but if, what about that uh, student over in the corner? Or what about this one that's struggling? How do you really involve them? So again, I talk about being intentional. You've got to do a checklist in your mind of how I, how I am involving them a lot. I, I like to use some of the elementary models that they have by having a popsicle stick with their name on or, or let students use any type of thing that gets them involved. And if it's a special day for them to go up the, to them quietly and say whatever it is, happy birthday, or uh, I heard that you got to do this, or if you can kind of sense that their day is not going so well, what can you do to make them smile or make them feel comfortable? I know that I always, always have these little heart candies. You know, I do teach in Loveland. We have everything that's a heart. And sometimes if I, <laughs> if I would see that they're a little down, I would just take one of these and just 
slip it on their desk and you know let them know i care and so when they know that you care they know that this is important to you they are important to you and they want to participate because they feel comfortable this is just the main main central point of this and i totally agree with all of that and i think from another one from the instructional side is really putting together the context that are meaningful um I, you know, I, I really do believe it's very important that if you're in a big district or you're in a district at all, and there's more than one, even one teacher, you can't be doing your own thing. It does not help the student as they move from one teacher to the next or one school to the next. And even though you might not totally agree with all the content that is there, you probably had a chance to help with it. You still need to honor that but how do you connect the kids to it? Because so many of those types of themes or units, et cetera, are open in the, you know, the curriculum process. Well, how am I gonna bring that student into that context? Because I think that says to the student too, this class is more than just learning about words. This class is learning about communicating in a variety of contexts that you will experience in the real world or even, you know, as you move on with a career. Right. And, you know, I'm going to touch back on something that you said about that kind of showing the students that you care. There's a lot of research to show that students will rise to those standards if they know that the teachers genuinely care about them as individuals. And like you do the little hearts, I had stuffed animals in my room and we used them sometimes for actual activities, but the students knew they could go get an animal anytime if they just needed one at their desk or, you know, bringing every single learner's voice into the room. Um, in my case, before the technology existed, I used index cards, right. but then I had an app um, right. so that I could hear from everyone. And um, it, all of this, you said, not just learning about words, but helping our students learn who they are and what their place is in this in their community and in the broader world and and how they fit in and that they do in fact fit in and they have a place and each one of them does i want to share a little bit you talked about your animals i remember when you, students sometimes they get a little anxious about doing presentational speaking or interactive speaking so i would have a, a box of animals like stuffed animals like you and i would always tell them you know tomorrow before you take the test you know that you're going to do do this presentational speaking you're gonna have a chance to practice with your partners but i'm going to bring in a group of visiting french uh, professors and these visiting french professors are going to let you practice with them so when you finally do this you're really good so here we are getting ready and i go i'm going to go get them there out in the hall and i brought in the big box <laughs> of stuffed animals and the look on their faces was like it, the smile was as wide as anything and so i still remember some of the big senior boys would take them out talking to a stuffed bear <laughs> and then what would happen i said well interact with your animal and ask them to help you fill out the rubric and no matter how old they were that going back to a sense of play that really opens up their heart oh my goodness I still think about those times. Absolutely. And their willingness to communicate just bursts open. They see you taking risk. They want to take risk. Exactly. Yes. And doing, and you're doing so in ways that support them and recognize each of them as individuals with needs beyond just accomplishing something or earning a grade. Yeah, right. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, we, um, so of those same five steps that we talked about earlier for building that classroom discourse community, is there one that you find to be more difficult than others for teachers? And if so, how have you helped teachers or how would you help teachers embed that step as part of their practice? I think uh, when you think a little bit about this, um, I think the one that I find a little bit harder is the one when we talked about how you distinguish between the IREs and the IRFs. And well, you know, I've been teaching for a long time and those kind of IREs were status quo at that time. You know what I mean? And how do you really pay attention to yourself? I get it. It's so important that the teacher intentionally plans, think about their self, and the self-reflection of the teacher about 
what they are doing, how it impacts the engagement of students and how it impacts student learning. So, and building that community. And I think it's, so to look back at yourself and to think about that, you know, it might be a way that, I know sometimes I would think about writing on my hand, <laughs> you know, something that would remind me not to do some of those, those things. But I think those other ones are so important. I think also they're, they just kind of come, the chit chat kind of comes from being that part of context and humor just kind of comes out of you <laughs> or comes out of them. And so I think it, it's hard to distinguish between them, but I still think the top two are that the relationship and then having some meaningful context. And then you can go from there. Well, and I think you brought up a really good point because a lot of teachers who have really good intentions and want to apply these things and see other teachers doing so successfully don't necessarily realize that there was in fact intentional planning because what they planned and the procedures they put in place and the supports they did and the scaffolds they made, all of that seems invisible sometimes when someone happens to look in from the outside. And so they end up kind of flummoxed wondering how come this teacher is doing so well at getting their students to speak and to sound so natural and so on. And so you bring up a really good point of that needing, especially at first, to really plan for it and to plan for each aspect of it. Right, and you have to remember that these are high leverage teaching practices. These are researched. So they're researched when someone says, well, I would just rather talk about grammar and doing this. I said, well, you're not going to get what you need out of this. And particularly if you will stick in IREs and not IRFs. And when they said, well, the kids want it. I said, that's probably not true. You probably more want it. And we're moving on. We all grow from the research that's provided and high leverage teaching practices, that's what they are. And not because someone said, oh, this is cool. I'm just gonna call it this. But there's a whole series of research behind all of these, which really says, if I'm gonna get anywhere with these students and help them grow, I need to pay attention to this. I constantly need to be in a growing state myself. That's just so important. Absolutely. Um do you have maybe one final thought you'd like to share regarding how to build and sustain a classroom discourse community? Yes. I still say you really have to work on building those relationships. You're not going to go anywhere if you don't have the relationships. Absolutely not at all. So that's the most important part. So you work on that as you're integrating these other things that you're doing within the instructional framework to engage them. But it's always, how do you get to that heart center that they trust you, that they want to be there and they want to continue? So I still think that's the essence of all of this. And you know, and the other part of this, I said time and time again, intentional planning. You've got to have intentional planning and you have to be a, a reflective practitioner. If something didn't go right, why? why and of course we all grow from those things when we have failures too but we have to reflect back and forth in order to have success and i that's just what i believe in totally about this one well and i think um we always say we want our students to feel comfortable learning from mistakes and growing and we have to show that we ourselves are willing to do that um, and I also like to talk to teachers sometimes about reef when they're planning. Um, some teachers have found it helpful to kind of reframe their lens when they when they attack that planning job to be planning for learning rather than planning for teaching. Absolutely. And that can sometimes help them really ground themselves in what is it that my students and my learners will be engaged in and what will they need to be successful if that's what they're going to do. Because you can't emphasize enough, like you said, the relationships, the intentionality of our practice and the planning and so on. Well, I think another thing we have to think about that it's language acquisition. It's not, I've got it today and I've mastered. We don't have mastery. We have acquisition, which is a long plan that builds from one step to the other to keep growing and engaging. And so when we think about both what, what is the student learning and how am I helping the student learn more so the acquisition continues along their pathway to proficiency? 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. Thank you so much, Tony. It was truly our pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Love uh, always working with you, Nicole. <laughs> Me too. I love working with you. This is really fun. Um, our next interview will feature Stephen Chudy and Don Dola, whose expertise in designing learning experiences based on authentic documents will provide powerful insight for HLTP3, guiding learners to interpret and discuss authentic texts. So until next time, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.